Thank you, Tiffany. Um, our next speaker is Simon Palfrey, who is professor of English literature and a fellow of Brazenose College. His research spans early modern drama and epic and romantic poetry. He has written several books on Shakespeare and is co-curating the upcoming Bodleian exhibit to mark the 400th anniversary of Shakespeare's death. OK, so the um, project that I'm uh, doing here is um, called Demons Land, A Poem Come True. And it's a, it's a multimedia project that tries to bring to life one of the great poems of the English Renaissance, which is um, Edmund Spencer's Fairy Queen. Now, the Fairy Queen, for those who don't know it, is a, it's a sort of hallucinogenic masterpiece. <laughs> it's very erotic, very beautiful, very long, very strange, and frequently very savage. Um, it was written by Spencer in Ireland during the most violent years of the Elizabethan conquest, the plantation. It's a poem equally of fervent imperialism, uh, Protestant militancy, um, but also of uh, disappointment, disaffection. Spencer's mission in Ireland failed, um, and his poem both reflects this and tries to redeem the failure. And it offers a model of the necessary future as much as a diagnosis of, of, of his present. I think that's crucial, the sense it's looking towards futures. The poem is also um, notoriously unfinished. Now, our project, in a sense, continues where Spencer stopped. Fairy Queen is, in some ways, the ultimate humanist poem in its claim to change or to model lives. There's an immensely serious claim for art um, in this period, which I think we want to, um, in a sense, recover. How seriously might we take this claim today? <coughs> now, we're all familiar with the idea that a poem might reflect or record history, but what if a poem predicts history? Or what if history is itself structured like a poem? And then what if we extend these kind of questions to life itself? What if it's poetry that gives us the template for existing? What if a life is an allegory? What if lives only happen if they are seen or if they are sympathised with, like in a poem? If you don't notice it, it's not there. What if metaphors are true? Or what if life is organised in rhymes and stanzas and endlessly repeating rhythms? What might it mean to be subject to a poem, like a character is? And so the question becomes, what does it mean, what might it mean for a poem to come true, for the possible to become the actual? Now, questions like this, I think, can't really be tested in conventional scholarly forms. I decided they needed a correspondent creative work to test them. So first of all, I translated um, Fairy Queen, or bits of it, into a new dramatic story. And very briefly, it's a story of a person I've called The Collector, who's a, it's not an autobiography just by the way, it's a, a rapturous romantic who, um, who vowed literally to create a world in the image of the fairy queen. And this was the experiment called Demon's Land. Now Demon's Land was, so this is, we're talking about the, um, around 1800, and uh, Demon's Land is itself a shadow history of Van Demon's Land, which happens to be my home state, or you know, Tasmania. The idea here being that modernity, in all of its hope, all of its horror, is a tale of the poem coming differently imperfectly, differentially to life throughout history. And this is a, a, a sort of a conceit about colonialism, really, or post-colonialism. Now, the collector's mission failed, but not because his world failed to be like the poem, but because the poem was other than he thought. It had energies and lives and untapped implications that his discipline hadn't <coughs> imagined. And in that is a kind of metaphor, I think, <coughs> for our discipline. Um, I'm interested in imagination, really, and, and, and its responsibilities and its possibilities. Now, <coughs> the question for me, then, was how to give life to the collector's experiment. I wanted, in a sense, I'm repeating what I'm saying the collector's doing. I wanted to do more than just report upon some uh, made-up story or propose a hypothesis and leave it like that. I wanted to animate this vision, embody its possibility or its impossibility, and so I decided to ask the same questions of other art forms, as I was asking of poetry. What if a painting, or a film, or a song came true? And then, what if this coming true is Demon's Land? Demon's Land, of course, is just a hypothesis. It doesn't actually exist. It exists as art. Now, the only way to achieve this was through knowledge exchange. Indeed, in a sense, knowledge exchange is the sort of meta-subject of this whole project, as different disciplines interpret and translate and supplement one another, and try to be equal to life. So I you know, interviewed various people, talked to various people, got to know various people along. I, I can't talk about all that right now, but the people I ended up working with primarily is a young filmmaker, very talented, called Mark Jones, a brilliant Oxford artist called Tom de Fresen, who's, who wanted to be here, but he's actually in Madrid looking at Goya, right, <laughs> as you speak. Um, a bunch of animators, 
and the per uh, feminist performance poet and director Hannah Silver. These people I'm sort of working very, very closely with and have been working with Mark and Tom for 18 months now. But anyway, to do this, is to, 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 to achieve this is not simple at all. It's, it's quite difficult. We couldn't just film actors playing pre-written parts. I mean, you know, uh, it's, it's a very, very different job from trying to, to film or, or, or play Shakespeare. Um, just briefly, I mean, Fairy Queen is not a normative world. Um, the, 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 the creatures in it are often non-human or they're simulacra or they're sort of becoming humans. Um, you get memory held in trees and ponds and, and, and a lot of the figures are like these kind of sort of dinosaurs that kind of emerge suddenly and then disappear suddenly. Um, it's an unbuilt world or it's a world that, that, that is kind of made and unmade as you enter it, almost like a video game in that sense. Um, the, you can't presuppose a, 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 an actor's life-size body. It, it just would fail if you tried to do that. Um, a couple of examples, like the very first stanza in the whole poem has this, 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 un, this knight arriving, and he's basically characterised by his armour, and his armour is not him. His armour has dints from <coughs> somebody else, and so he's kind of hiding inside the armour. What his body is, 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 is a total mystery. He might just be some kind of intelligent gel or something. You know, that's what <laughs> I, you know. um, well, there's, a, there's a famous moment when Britomart, one of the heroines, looks in a mirror and, see, and begins to see herself, then she, th th this vision turns into her future lover, and then she leaves, and she, then she leaves that, that moment in, in des <coughs> desperate, gut-wrenching pain, which is simultaneously the pain of entering into womanhood, the pain of longing, the pain of menstruation, but also the pain, as she soon finds out, is of actually being burdened with hundreds and hundreds of years of history, past and future. When to, to, that, that kind of sort of morphology, that kind of way of thinking about a life, it's, it's a long, long, long away, away from, say, soap opera or television. <coughs> um, you get all sorts of characters who are supplemented by each other, lots of surrogacies. One life continues another life. You know, the, every, everyone's unfinished. And so we, wanted to, we, we, we needed to think about how we might form this, how we might embody this. It meant going back to basics, about the, 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 the real fundamental constituents of the world at every level, language and, and body. So, um, now, so if you try, for example, we, we did some stuff with some animators, thinking that might be the, the clue. But we found um, some very good ones too. But we found that digital animation, for example, as much as it can, could sort of mimic these kinds of mutations, was also wrong for us because it erased the trace. There was no material trace in the actual uh, what, what was there. Now, if we had millions of pounds, no doubt we could overcome that problem. <laughs> but we, we don't have that yet. So we decided what we decided to do was to trust foundationally in the possibilities, say, for example, of Tom's painting. And we wanted to explore that. Genuinely, I mean, Tom's really engaged with the question of what a history painting might be. Um, he does it very seriously. Um, and we wanted to think about painting as something which is not just completed or a static surface, but it's something that's filmed or photographed during the process of its composition, something which might be, f might be flowing, might be actually, you know, the, the painting is as much before it freezes, as it were, as, as, as when it's frozen. We might rub it out or paint it over or cut it up. Um, film it or photograph it. And so the stages of the painting can express stages of history, you know, like a layered archive of its own becoming. Um, we've also been experimenting with the kind of figures between dif different, again, different stuff, so between painterly and real worlds, or um, using paint flow as a channel, so actually making it the flow of paint move us from a painterly world to an as though real world and then back again, this sort of stuff. Um, in composing our characters, again, we've been moving between cutouts and puppets and masks and clay wash and then the human face and then back again, this, this sort of thing. Not trying to erase the trace at all, but trying to capitalise upon this coexistent presence of all these different materials. <coughs> anyway, um, so we bring all this together in, a, in an exhibition. We decided, so it's, it's, it's in the, the, the outputs of this are a, a multiple. The f in a sense, the first one is an exhibition, and, and this, this we ge generate, or I generated, another fiction for this. And there's a contemporary woman um, at the moment called Ola who discovers the paintings, and we're saying that Tom's paintings come from the collector from the 1800s. She discovers the texts of the, of the dwarf, who's uh, um, the collector's sort of secretary, like Spencer was the secretary of Lord Grey in Ireland and so forth. And she recovers his story, supplements the text, presents an exhibition purporting to be the history. And, and they are her films in this fiction. She is trying to recover this. She, she's trying to make it come true because her experience, because the, uh, because the premise of the thing has to be that, that the history is still repeating today. So this brings it into the present in that sense. There'll be two versions of the um, exhibition. There's a live, live touring version, which we're going to various places. I'll talk about that in one sec as a final point. And also a digital version, which we're doing. Now, the, the, the final point I want to make is that we're, we're looking to 
stage this, present this exhibition at various locations. We, and we, we want to engage with the location so that the host becomes an, an active part in the exhibition. So what we've been working with Oliver Cox, I don't know if Oliver's here, but um, uh, the national, he knows all the National Trust properties, and we've been talking with a bunch of them, um, where their histories are also animate with the same kind of ambivalence, same kind of difficulty. And what we're interested in doing is not some kind of rose-tinted um, version of English heritage, but rather the idea of genuinely engaging with the difficulty of history and sort of vivifying these buildings. So, for example, the, the, the Stowe National Trust place, not the school, but the, um, the buildings, they've got these palaces and grottos, these temples, which are actually an architecturalised version of the Fairy Queen. And so we can stage it in this and turn the whole place into a version of Demon's Land, for example. We've got, we, there's also the island. We want, we're interested in um, putting it on in the archipelago, the sort of British-Irish archipelago. So we're going up to Butte, Mount Stewart House is kind of neo-Gothic monstrosity, but, but it's an amazing place. And um, they want to host it and f have the centerpiece of their uh, of their 300th anniversary celebrations. And so that there's, they get wh whatever they get 50,000 people over the two months, and they're hoping to increase that by 10 or 15 percent with this and lots of publicity. Um, this going to Australia. I've got a p fellowship there. It's Sydney, Perth, and um, Brisbane uh, in two th late 2017. And we're hoping to other locations after that. So it's it's a it's a travelling thing. Um, and so architecture becomes another art with which we're engaging, building an architecture, another one. Um, and then finally, there's, a, there's, a, there's a things that I'm doing, which is trying to use this process to, to generate new ways of writing. Um, and so I'm writing a, a, a critical fiction, I call it, which will be a kind of version of the project. And I'm also talking with Faber about producing a selected fairy queen. So as to, it's, it's so long, it's kind of forbidding, it's so heavy, it's hard to lift. Um, and to, to produce a, 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 an artfully constructed version of the book, which will emphasise its its eroticism and its danger and its strangeness, um, and they're very interested in that. So hopefully that will bring it to other new audiences. Thank you. Thank you.